Hello and welcome to Corpus Cast, part of the Aston Originals series, providing fresh perspectives from Aston University experts. My name is Robbie Love and I'm a lecturer in English language here at Aston University. I'm a corpus linguist, meaning that I study linguistic patterns, trends and variations using large samples of language data. So on behalf of the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group, welcome to the show. Corpus Cast is the show all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. And thanks to your positive feedback to our first three episodes with Paul Baker, Eleanor Semino, and Pasquale Perez Paredes, uh, I'm thrilled that Corpus Cast will be continuing for uh, the remainder of the year, which is great news. So we'll be carrying on. And in this series, I'll be speaking with top researchers in the field to find out more about how corpus linguistics can be applied to a diverse range of areas. So in this episode of Corpus Cast, our topic is how corpus linguistics contributes to research in the area of forensic linguistics. Forensic linguistics is one of our specialist areas here at Aston University, so I didn't have to venture very far to find not one, but two guests to speak with me on this topic in today's episode. Uh, I'll be speaking to Tim Grant, Professor of Forensic Linguistics here at Aston University and Director of the Aston Institute for Forensic Linguistics, whose mission is to improve the delivery of justice through the analysis of language. Tim is one of the world's leading practitioners in forensic linguistics, widely published, uh, particularly in the area of authorship attribution and in contexts including online communication, police interviews, and cases of sexual assault and has provided evidence in numerous criminal cases. I'll also be speaking to Dr. Lucia Busso, a research associate in forensic linguistics at the Aston Institute for Forensic Linguistics. Lucia is a cognitive linguist who uses corpus methods to inform her work in forensic contexts, specifically contexts including the analysis of abusive letters, as we'll be discussing today, and language in the news media. So we have not one, but two guests here today, and we'll be discussing the role of corpus linguistics in forensic linguistics. So I'm very pleased to welcome both Tim Grant and Lucia Busso to Corpus Cast. Hello, Hi, Tim, Robbie. hello, Hi, Lucia, Robbie. and welcome. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both for uh, agreeing to come on. And this is the first time we've had not one, but two guests together. So yeah. uh, I'm really excited about this. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks both of you for uh, for coming along. Um, I want to start with you, Lucia, um, uh, as as you are more sort of directly active uh, in in corpus uh, linguistics specifically, and then we'll move on to talk about forensic linguistics as well. Yeah. Um, this is a question I ask uh, all all of my guests to to start off the episode. Um, what does corpus linguistics mean to you? What is it? Ah, okay, so. Uh... Difficult question, but um, I think I can answer by saying that I distinctly remember when I first heard of corpus linguistics during my undergrad degree, um, you know, just mentioning it um, by my professors. And I was really, really impressed by the terms ecological data, which is somehow, you know, sometimes how we refer to corpus linguistics, because you're looking at data in their natural habitat, some, you know, somehow you just observe language. And that was um, amazing to me. I immediately liked it because I'm a firm belief in observational science. So I like to be a fly on the wall and just observe everything that's going on. Uh, so I was immediately drawn to that. So I think that that kind of attitude just stuck with me. So for me, corpus linguistics is being able to observe language, language change, um, how people use language, um, what can language do in society, by being a little fly on a wall behind a screen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that. I like that that animal metaphor. I often use uh, the bird's eye view metaphor, mm, yeah, looking yeah. over a large sample of uh, the the landscape of language, so to speak. So that's that's great. We've got the fly on the wall and the the bird in the sky. So we'll yes, see what else excellent. we come up with. Um, how did you uh, get started in corpus linguistics? Um, well, by chance, this short answer is <laughs> because so for my undergraduate dissertation in Italy, uh, I studied my undergrad uh, degree was at the University of Perugia, where I'm from. And um, so I really wanted to study 
the grammaticalization of adverbial phrases in Italian, because I noticed that sometimes you have like these phrases that are separate words, but speakers are not really conscious that they are separate words anymore. So they kind of write them together or they misspell them. So I was interested in looking at that and I had no idea how to do that. <laughs> so I went to my supervisor and she introduced me to corpus linguistics. So that was like my first corpus based um, analysis and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, I, I hear from a lot of people that they end up getting into it by chance um, yeah. and then realizing what it's all about and deciding, okay, I want to keep doing this for a long time to come. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's great to hear. Thanks, uh, thanks Lucia. Um, we'll, we'll move over to, to Tim now. Um, you just heard uh, Lucia talking uh, about uh, corpus linguistics. So I'm going to ask you a similar question about forensic linguistics. Um, what would you say is the, the central endeavor, if you will, of a forensic linguist? Um, so forensic, there's lots of sort of definitions of forensic linguists, which can include sort of lists of tasks we might get involved in or um, list of topic areas that forensic linguists study. Um, I, I like to take a sort of functional definition for forensic linguistics. And you, you mentioned it in your intro that, you know, forensic linguistics is an attempt to improve the delivery of justice through the analysis of language. And that, that can take a variety of forms. So at the Aston Institute, we have people studying um, the language of police interviews and interrogations. Uh, some of Lucia's project is in um, lay legal text, the language of contracts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my own work tends to be at the investigative end of forensic linguistics, where I help police or others uh, with their investigations. And I, I sometimes, as you've said, end up taking evidence to court. So forensic linguistics is a broad umbrella, but it covers all these things. And the unifying idea is this idea of improving the delivery of justice. Um, if it's to do with justice and uh, through language analysis, then, then, then it counts as forensic linguistics for me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's that's really interesting, and and it's you know amazing as as a relatively new uh, colleague here at Aston to uh, see this incredible team of forensic linguists that you've amassed in in your in your institute. Um, some of some of whom, of course, including Lucia, are um, are trained in in corpus uh, methods. You you wouldn't necessarily describe yourself as a corpus linguist, Tim, um, but of course you you have use corpus methods in, in your work. And, and as I mentioned, you work with corpus linguists, including Lucia. So could you kind of summarize the, the, the main ways that corpus linguistics, in your view, contributes to the sort of work that you do in forensic linguistics? Sure. So um, there, there are different ways in which we, we use corpus linguistics. So, so, so if you're studying um, legal texts or or phone calls. Um, we've got a colleague who's studying um, domestic violence phone calls to 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 ask for help and so on. Mm. Um, there are a variety of linguistic methods you can apply. You can apply conversation analysis methods. Um, you can do sort of um, various forms of critical discourse analysis. If you're interested in the pursuit of justice, justice is about power, and critical discourse analysis can be really useful. But but very often um, we will we will amass a fairly large amount of text, and and that that's where corpus linguistics comes into its own. So so we will build corpora from forensic texts and forensic contexts to study what's going on in those contexts. But also in my own uh, investigative work, a lot of the work I do is on authorship analysis, and there's two or three forms that authorship analysis takes. So there's the idea of profiling an author from their text. So this is about studying language variation across gender, across age, across professional registers. And all of this is best achieved through through building relevant corpora and then looking for similarities and differences. Um, and in comparative authorship analysis in the actual casework, um, you've got to say what's, what's typical and what's distinctive in a certain speech community or language community. Mm. And the only way you can get this sort of base rate knowledge as to what features stand out for an individual um, is, is through building corpora of some kind or another. So you'd end up uh, comparing texts um, that have been written 
potentially by a particular individual um, to to other mm. texts and, and finding what's distinctive? Yeah, so say um, uh, you have, uh, a th um, well, we're, we're going to talk in a minute about the Operation Heron Letter, so, so I'll yeah. go in a different direction rather yeah, than yeah. discover that. Um, so say you have a, um, a disputed communication and you have a, a suspect for having written that. So it might be someone, someone's written you a threatening letter, Robbie. Mm -hmm. And, oh, um, and um, the police have done some investigation and they've looked at your computer and then maybe they've identified the, where it's come from. So they have a suspect and, that, and the, the, then they get a warrant and they seize the suspect's computers and they can't find the actual threat that, that was sent to you, but they find lots of other writings from that suspect. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so the question then is, so you can just look at the similarity in the language, the word choice, the syntax, the pragmatics of, of what they wrote, and look for similarity in all this wealth of text that we've now captured from their computer. But that's not enough, okay, because it's not mm -hmm. enough because, um, you know, they both, both, both in the threatening communication and from their computer, they will both use the word the. Okay, so that's a point of similarity, right? Mm. That's only an important point of similarity if you can show that the, the suspect uses it in an atypical way. Mm. And at that point, to answer the question, well, what's atypical about their language use? You have to have some background corpus that you're comparing their language to. And this is where forensic linguistics gets interesting because what's the ideal background corpus? Is it a general corpus of English language like the BNC or something like that, or is it something from their close speech community? Mm -hmm. um, because if you just say a word is atypical against English language in a, or British English in a general sense, that's not enough to say it's atypical. They, you might be picking up features of Birmingham English, and the BNC represents some Birmingham English, but every speaker of Birmingham English would be atypical. So you want to really narrow down your corpus collection onto their speech community. And so these are the ways in which we collect on the fly different corpora for comparison purposes from one case to the next. Um, and, and often they're fairly small corpora. You, you and Lucia were talking about big corpus mm. methods and bird's eye views. Our corpora will be collected from within a particular case and therefore won't be into the millions and even billions of words. They will be a lot smaller than that very often. I think you raise a really interesting point there because because often when uh, we talk about corpus linguistics, the instinct is to say, oh yes, it's looking at big samples of language mm. using these particular methods of looking for patterns or relationships between words. But as you say, actually now, um, the, the, the the diversification of the applications as of what this series is all mm. about, looking at different ways that these methods are applied, Yes, some of it is really going down the so-called big data route with massive data sets. But in, in, in your case, you might be analyzing a corpus comprising a few text messages or... Um, yeah, so, so this is where thinking, thinking about the building the corpus from the language community gets really interesting. Because So if, if, if the threat was sent uh, to you by text message mm. and, or, um, and we, we've arrested the suspect, we think we know who, who it was, but we haven't demonstrated that, and, and the forensic linguistics is going to contribute to that as evidence. Um, what, what I would do is, so you've got the phone download, they've downloaded all the messages sent from the device that the police have seized, and it doesn't contain the actual, um, the actual threatening communication. But what, what you will have on that phone is you will have probably several hundred, sometimes say 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 other messages that person has written. Mm. Yeah. So you're talking about, say, 10,000 messages of about 10 words or five words. So 100,000 word corpus of their language. But then what I do is I ask for all the other messages on that phone because that's quite a nice representation of that person's language community. Mm. So, um, so I might have another um say 10 50 000 words of other people's language that that person communicates with quite a lot and that can create my background corpus so what i'm asking then is against their speech community what do they do that's atypical and i if i can establish that there's some language features that's atypical in their speech community i can then go and look at the disputed communication the anonymous mm -hmm. threat and say 
well, we know this set of six, eight, 12 features are really unusual in their speech community. And here they are, or here they're not in mm -hmm. the disputed text. And then you can draw some conclusion of consistency and distinctiveness. We don't draw the conclusions and therefore they wrote it. We leave that mm -hmm. to the jury. We just point out how rare the feature is and that it occurs across the different contexts. Wow, goodness, that's incredible. It really is. And and you, you mentioned before um, Operation Heron, which is a particular case that, that you worked on. I'd like to talk about that um, some more. Uh, th this, this was a case of somebody sending some pretty nasty letters um, a little over a decade ago. Is that right? I wonder, Tim, if you could tell us a bit more yeah. about the context behind this case, but in particular. Uh, so, so I was asked to get involved in this by, by the police. Um, and it was uh, a number of individuals in the public eye and also private individuals had been sent some um, racially and sexually abusive letters, old fashioned letters, written letters. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and the letters had been sent for about an 18 month to two year period, 2007, 2009, that sort of timing. And um, the, there's all sorts of forensics went into examining who, who had written these letters. Um, they ended up writing to the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown, which is why the police got very interested as to, to what was going on. They weren't threatening communications, they were abusive communications. Right. Um, and, uh, and so you get all sorts of forensics in a case like this where you get, um, they'll be able to say where they were posted from. And obviously they're testing for fingerprints and DNA and other mm. stuff. But my task was to say, can I say anything about the writer? And this is a classic forensic linguistic profiling task. It's a form mm. of authorship analysis where it's never going to be used in evidence. We don't, the, the courts don't allow that to be admitted as evidence in the way that they would allow a comparative authorship analysis to be admissible. Um, so I was first asked, could I profile the writer? And um, I came up with a profile um, of, of an older woman writer. Um, and then in the end, I ended up appearing on BBC Crime Watch. Um, to put an appeal out about did anyone recognize the language in these letters because we know that that people recognize language style and there were also some interesting cartoons and so on um, that were involved so so it resulted in a crime watch appeal and that had, indirectly but that eventually led to the the arrest of the perpetrator oh so, so we, the individual was found eventually yes they it was it was quite fun um because I'd said it was an older woman, and some of the police officers on the case believed that it would be a young skinhead type person, um, probably a bloke. And um, and they found, so as a result of the Crime Watch appeal, one of the things we were asking for was, are there further victims? Are there other people who've received these letters who've not re reported them to the police? And someone came forward with a very recent letter that had a thumbprint on it. And that thumbprint uh, had someone on their database, and it was a young skinhead man um, who was a sailor out of Portsmouth. Mm. And um, uh, he was away at sea, and his boat was coming in two or three days. So they arrested him off the boat. And then when they um, took him home to search his house, he lived with his elderly mum, and she had been writing the letters. So, uh, so it was. So I, I wouldn't be telling the story if I'd got the profile wrong. But on this instance, I was able to profile the the demographics of, of the writer. Wow, that's uh, that's incredible. Um, and it must have been quite a satisfying moment when you realised that you, your guess was, uh, was yeah. pretty accurate in the end. I'd, I'd like to correct the word guess. It was based in linguistic oh, yes. science, of course. <laughs> your, yes, of but course. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and, <laughs> More recently, uh, Lucia, uh, you and, and Tim and, and uh, a couple of your colleagues um, uh, in the Institute um, published or in the process of publishing a, a, a paper about this case. So um, I, I sort of want to turn to you in terms of returning to a case from um, some time ago. Uh, what was what was the motivation in, in coming back to this this case sometime later, Lucia? Um, well, so there were a couple of reasons, actually, that sort of piled up. Um, well, you, the most practical reason was that we had the data, right? Because in forensic linguistics, access to data is actually uh, quite difficult and time consuming. And um, so we had the data set already and we were looking through, you know, um, 
possible data sets and what would be interesting to analyze how do we do it some sort of these brainstorming meetings that we would have with the other members of our research team which are Sarah Atkins and Martin Petico and um, we came up to, with uh, this sort of idea of doing a methodological contribution to forensic linguistics uh, trying to integrate quantitative and qualitative methods of corpus analysis. So showing with a case that was already solved. So we already knew that um, who was the perpetrator, what were their motives, you know, all these things were already known. And we wanted to see if by doing some sort of a confirmatory linguistic analysis, we could sort of come up with, well, one, the same result, right? And mm. P, to add something to what was already known, right? To add some more shade um, to what was already in the public domain about this, both you know from the police investigation and from the linguistic analysis that um, Tim did in 2009. So that was the main reason that we ended up using that data set particularly. So uh, what what did you find, and and how did corpus linguistics help you to to make your observations? Um, so again, we were talking about like different sizes in corpora. Mm. And this is a pretty good example because this corpus is actually um, less than ten thousand words long. Oh wow! Okay. I've written I've written longer longer papers and maybe longer angry texts probably. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, and it was in, in this uh, in this case it was actually pretty useful because all the members of the research team. Well, Tim was of course really familiar with the data set. We were not at the beginning, but uh, Martin and I kind of cleaned the corpus and you know systematized it a little bit. And we actually read through the whole thing, right? So we had some qualitative hunches, but what we did was, um, first thing that was done was I performed a topic modeling algorithm, which is a text mining and uh, machine learning type of thing where you, where this algorithm basically finds out through statistical techniques um, what are the main themes that are discussed in a certain mm -hmm. collection of documents. Um, but clearly what the algorithm gives uh, is a black box, right? The algorithm doesn't explain, oh, you know, I found this because I was thinking of that, or, you know, this word's correlated with another word. So we found out through this computational technique that there were four main topics that the author was rambling about, mm -hmm. basically. So healthcare, um, immigration, and then politics A and politics B, we call them. So two different strands of like propaganda and like politics talking. Mm. And the second part of the analysis was extracting the words from these topics. So seeing, okay, so you found this, why did you find this? Like, what were the words that um, led the algorithm to this result? And, and then my colleague, Martin, did a qualitative semantic tagging kind of analysis on the corpus. And we, through that corpus analysis and through interreliability testing, so we uh, had coders coming in and, you know, see if the uh, taxonomy that we found was kind of reliable or, you know, it was people that were not from our research group could come up with the same conclusions that we did, some sort of thing. Mm. Um, and we, through that type of analysis, we were actually able to see inside the black box of the algorithm. So to see what was, what were the uh, complaints and demands that um, were making up, right, mm. these, these topics. And um, we, correl we, you know, used that plus some sort of, some statistical analysis, regression-like statistical analysis, using the algorithm as well to uh, add some fine-grained information. So, for example, we know that healthcare, so the topic of healthcare comes in the earlier letters. So from 2007, she starts, the author um, starts talking about healthcare a lot, complaining. And the main complaint was that the NHS was ruined because there were too many immigrants working as doctors and not enough space given to English citizens. And and then as time progresses, she moves on. So she doesn't talk about healthcare that much anymore. And she starts talking about more about politics. 
immigration mm-hmm. remains constantly like she's constantly complaining about immigrants and you know immigration is not a good thing blah 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 but then after healthcare she starts talking about political themes mm. and sending letters no more to nhs doctors as she did in the first time um, of her writings yeah. but start sending um, letters to individuals in the public eye, like Gordon Brown, for example, or mm. even private citizens, um, basically campaigning for the SNP party. So oh. she really wants um, Scotland to gain independence from England mm. because she considers Scottish people to immigrants, to be immigrants as well. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. She, Welcome she to our world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, she also talks a lot about Brexit, which was quite, um, you know, eerie in a sense. Because, like, mm. Mm, you might be seeing, you know, you know, okay, this was 2009, but still. Yeah. And um, so she moves on to talk about, like, these political themes and also using these qualitative and very fine grained semantic analysis. We were also able to distinguish between the two political themes that the algorithm found. Um, which to us at a first glance looked pretty similar, but we're like, Mm -hmm. okay, the algorithm says so, so we're going to use them both, I guess. Mm -hmm. But then doing this quality analysis, we were actually able to see that politics A, I think if I remember correctly, um, is very much about um, the Scottish independence. So, you know, uh, voting the Scottish National Party, um, blah, blah, blah. Whereas in um, politics B, if I remember correctly, I might be getting them wrong, but uh, you know, one of those was about mm-hmm. SNP, and the other was pretty much complaining about how much Scottish people exploit English money, English taxes. Um, so they go together clearly because they make up the same argument, but one is more focused on the cause, so the Scottish mm-hmm. exploit the English, and the other one is more of the result of that cause. So you know. Scottish people should then vote for S and P and go away, <laughs> basically. And yeah, it was a really interesting um, study to do and very interesting methodologies to put together because it was something that has not been previously done, at least to our to the extent of our knowledge. And so it was really nice to see how uh, the quantitative based and the qualitative based analysis kind of come together in the end so they can really help each other in, in, in you know giving actually very precious information wow that's incredible and just to to sort of remind myself here you all of these approaches that you took are on a data set that's not even ten thousand words you know um yeah. so i guess you could say that you're you're demonstrating what more can be learned beyond simply reading manual. oh yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely because most of these things you wouldn't necessarily pick up just mm. by doing not even a close reading of the text naturally, because we are, we are sensitive to the statistical input of the text, but uh, not at the yeah, level of the algorithm. I can vouch for that. You know, obviously, when I was involved in the case, I was reading these texts again and again and again. It's small enough that you could do that. Yeah. Um, and. You know, the, the, the question, what can you tell us about the writer, includes her interests and so on. And I, you know, I had a list of things that were topics that she was interested in. But but this fine-grained analysis isn't available just as a close reader. Mm. Um, uh, the uh, corpus analysis that, that we've now done as a sort of retrospective move shows far more about the shift in interest and so on. And, and that could have been useful in terms of the investigation. We don't we don't know retrospectively, but but to understand the anonymous writer, to understand that you know there's this move from healthcare into politics and the nature of the political interest. Um, I mean, there's any number of racists out there writing nasty letters, but the mm. Scottish angle is a little bit unusual, right? Um, mostly, and and she was uh, writing very objectionable things about Afro Caribbeans and mm. the people. South Asia and, and all the people that you might expect. But mm. the Scottish angle is a little unusual. And what does that mean? It tells you something about what's going on and, and can help the investigation. So there was more gleaned from the letters through the analysis that the Chiz just described than, than a, a, just a, a regular read through, even an intensive read through several times would, would bring out. 
Yeah. And and you mentioned before, Tim, about how um, you know, you you don't as a forensic linguist, you don't make the decision, you know, you don't yeah. make a judgment, you provide your expert uh, a, a, a opinion um, based on the data that you're presented. Um, I guess we, we could talk about Operation Heron, but also more, more generally in your, your experience. Um, how, <laughs> you know, forensic linguistics, my sort of layperson's understanding is that um, courts are a lot more accepting of linguistic evidence now than they were you know, a few decades ago, mm -hmm. and, and that awareness is increasing over time. Um, thanks, of course, to places like your your institute. Um, do, are, are there challenges? You know, when when you're sort of trying to convince people, okay, I've I've done some analysis of language, and I've and I've noticed these things. Do you know? You know, how easy is it to to get across the scientific aspect of what I suppose is traditionally viewed as more of an arts and humanities discipline, mm -hmm. thinking about language. So, so yeah, so first of all, the, the, the kind of uh, research that we did for, for Operation Heron would definitely come under our, the sort of the, the banner of profiling or with, with, I use the term sociolinguistic profiling. Tell us about the writer, what can we say about their social and linguistic background? Um, and that will never be admitted to the courts but one of the impacts we have is feeding into investigations, yeah, and they can be for the police or they can be for the defence. We're not prosecution biased in this, in in that in that sense. But the 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 sort of the question I heard really was was how is linguistic evidence accepted in the courts in the UK and elsewhere? Um, so authorship analysis has got a say 10, 15 year history of acceptance in in British courts. Um, it can be done wrong or it can be done right. And if it's done right, it can and should be accepted. Um, I think there's, there's various things going on in forensic science at the moment, which is really interesting. Um, in terms of all forensic science, scientists have come under attack as being too subjective and not sciencey enough. And part of the work we've been doing is to, to build the scientific foundations for authorship analysis. So we've got projects studying the, the idea of an idiolect. So mm -hmm. just as a dialect will be uh, a language variety for a geographical area, an idiolect would be a language variety for an individual. Do you have an idiolect? Is there such a thing as an idiolect? Does everyone have an idiolect? All these kind of fundamental research questions are massively important to the background of the foundational science in, in forensic authorship analysis. Um, so we, we, we contribute studies in that area um, when it comes to um, whether linguistic evidence should be admitted to court, uh, the, the, the standards are moving and getting sharper and harder. And it's all about validating your methods, moving away from a subject of expertise into something that, you know, another linguist would come along, use the same method and get the mm -hmm. same answer. And that's massively important. And the idea is that we should use validated methods and we should present our findings to the court as a weight of evidence, not a conclusion of guilt or, or, or innocence or match or non-match of two samples. So there's a lot of progress being made in forensic science at the moment, which we've been writing about and engaged in and trying to ensure that linguistic evidence is, is up to the mark in, in these senses. Um, so it, it is accepted, it's withstood appeal in the British courts and um, it's been admitted in courts across Europe. The German Federal Police, the BKA, have a forensic linguistic unit. They're the only um, country in the world that have a dedicated forensic linguistic unit and they have for some years. Um, other, other countries, there are different histories of, of how well admitted this kind of evidence is to the courts, but, but, but it's pretty well established. Mm. And so, uh, you know, you, obviously that's sort of one aspect of your work. Clearly also as academics, as we've discussed, you're publishing your work uh, in academic outputs. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these outputs can be accessed by anyone publicly. Um, when you're publishing about these sorts of cases and you're talking about the methods that you've used, mm -hmm. um, is there a, a, a danger that, someone who's looking to commit a, a linguistic crime or a crime that can be detected linguistically could get a hold of your work and go, ah, 
that's how they catch me. So I'm going to learn how to better yeah. avoid being caught because I know what they're doing to catch me. It might be sure. an obvious question, but also I'm just really curious as yeah. to the, the, is there a, is it, does that come into the conversation about what you do and crucially what you don't say when you're publishing your work in academic outputs? Yes. Um, the short answer is yes. Um, so I recently with Nikki McLeod did a project on online undercover policing. Um, and these are the police officers who um, are engaged often in anti-pedophile operations on and including on the dark web. Mm. Uh, so that area of the internet that is heavily encrypted and it's much harder to identify people on. Um, and um we were very careful what we did and didn't publish in in that text and there's a whole chunk of stuff that will never be published um and obviously there's a great push to as an academic publish or perish mm. and so there's all the stuff we, we we need to publish too and when we're working with a policing or governmental partners you know there's often an upfront negotiation of can we publish this and uh, after working on cases um, like the Operation Heron case, I'll go back and say, you know, the, the, is it okay to publish this now? Can I publish papers from it? And there's a fairly small set of casework that we have the proper permissions to to create publications from, which is why sometimes you see the same data reanalyzed and reanalyzed. Um, just as a sort of footnote to that, one of the projects um, that we're interested in is. Um, uh, how much knowledge there is of forensic linguistics are within these dark web communities and our colleague christoph Cradens is currently running a project asking precisely that question mm. where he's in a bit called the study looking for key terms associated with forensic linguistics and he does indeed find sort of security discussions of how not to get caught by forensic linguistics wow um so that's beginning to happen Mm. And you can predict an arms race. There's also, as well as authorship analysis, there's a there's a academic discipline in authorship obfuscation. So how do you take your personal style markers out of your text? Mm. At the moment, it's really quite poor quality. It reads like a machine generated text, like a bad version of Google Translate. Yeah. It doesn't read like a flowing text. You could tell something weirds happened to it, but presumably that will improve over the time. So so yeah, these are very real questions. That's that. That's a real challenge, as you say. As as academics, you know, the the instinct is to publish anything and everything we we do in our research. But clearly, you've got a really important line, and and not only necessarily with with potential or criminals or potential criminals finding your methods, but also presumably the sensitivity of some of the data that you have if you're working in um, particular contexts like the dark web or or abuse cases yeah. etc as well and uh, absolutely and one of our big concerns is researcher well-being mm. reading this material is nasty and it kind of comes with a cost um, and we we do try our best to mitigate that and and work with our researchers we the institute uh, has psychological support for researchers dealing with difficult data and so on and so forth and it's a it's a very real consideration a very real concern we have Mm -hmm. um, but, and and when we come to publish, um, we don't want to create sort of um, a voyeuristic sense of this is nasty forensic data. There's a lot of true crime podcasts out there and things like that where <laughs> they seem yeah. to they they there seems to be uh, almost purient interest in some of this stuff. And and when we publish, we we try not to do that. There comes a sort of a certain responsibility with this stuff. I think to mm -hmm. not feed that. That interest, which is just about the darkness, the dark side of things. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so these are very real issues if in in academic work as a forensic linguist and in in working as a forensic linguistic practitioner. So it's it's not as glamorous as people might assume. It doesn't feel very glamorous, I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's it's more um, I don't know uh, film noir than uh, Marvel. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, that that's a that's a good place to a, a good way to start wrapping things up. I want to I want to finish by asking both of you um, our usual set of quick questions that we that we have here to end our Corpus Cast episode. Ooh, okay. So um, I'll ask a question. I'll ask for a quick answer from Lucia, and then a quick answer from Tim, and then I'll okay. ask the next question. Okay. Um, so here we go. 
first quick question. What are the biggest changes you've noticed in corpus research in your career so far? Oh, uh, well, my career is fairly short. <laughs> so, <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> um, I guess that um, I'm noticing more and more the so-called quantitative shift in, in linguistics. I mean, I was, my career started right in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. So, but um, that's what I'm noticing that more and more people are relying more and more onto quantitative methods um, automated or not auto automated, but um, rather than just providing a qualitative analysis. Okay, That's thank you. Question. Same question for Tim. Okay, I've got two quick answers. One is right. size. <laughs> yeah. So, so I I recently came across my copy of the Cobuild Corpus, which fitted on a single uh, CD, not a DVD, um, mm -hmm. from 1991, and it was two million words. And that was one of the biggest corpus or corpora around. And these days we're dealing with billion word corpora and, and more. Mm -hmm. But the other I think is more interesting is that corpus linguistics has moved from being a subject matter of research to just another tool in the linguist toolbox. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the big change. I'm not a corpus linguist, but I use corpus methods all the time. And there are those who are developing more corpus methods and, and they're not just corpus users and corpus tool users, they're researchers in corpus linguistics. And I think um, any area of linguistics can be uh, enhanced through applying corpus methods. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, that's that's a really interesting point. Okay, I, 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 I want to say things too. I want to move on to the next <laughs> question. Always, I'll be breaking my own rule. Quick questions, quick answers. Okay, quick question number two. Uh, okay. Back to Lucia. Um, what has surprised you the most about your own work uh, in corpus linguistics? Oh, okay. Um, I guess that I will go back to what I was talking about before, about the um, verbal phrases work that I did for my undergrad. I then revisited it in a more, you know, nice way that the undergrad did with me. Um, and I published a paper out of this. And actually, it um, what really surprises me is that you can use uh, synchronic corpora, so corpora that just describes the language as is now, not not historical, not taking text from a long time ago. And then you can actually monitor language change just on a synchronic corpus if you have like a, a research question out of it. But that's to me, that's incredible. That's pretty fascinating. Thank you. OK, Tim. So I think um, data is always surprising. Mm. So we've got a PhD student at, in the Institute, Amy Booth, and she one of the things she's studying is the um, careers that white nationalists do posting on a, an online white nationalist forum. Yeah. And we're expecting slightly different shapes in these careers. People have been there for a long time. People appear and disappear. What we haven't been anticipating is career breaks. Yeah. So <laughs> some will, and, and so until you look at the data, you won't know what you'll see. And data is always surprising. And that's why you should be a corpus linguist or employ corpus methods. Can't think of a better advert. <laughs> think than that. <laughs> okay, final quick question back to Lucia. Um, and, and you can answer this, and this for both of you, you can answer this um, either specifically relating to forensic linguistics or more broadly, if you have ideas about that as well. How will corpus linguistics, uh, I, I should say, continue to make an impact uh, on the world in the future? Um, well, I think that corpus linguistics uh, in forensic linguistics, as Tim was saying, would definitely help in validating methods, right, to, especially in this quantitative shift. So employing like quantitative, reliable corpus methods could be a way of um, validating the you know the method that you use and talking about more generally about um society in widely um i think that uh, a lot of people are now realizing even non-linguists but uh, a lot of people are now realizing that we um we function through language everything we do has some sort of language so to analyze wide um societal discourse or you know things that have an actual impact in our world, like um, well, fake news or uh, coronavirus, you you have to analyze the language, and through the language, you can actually see how a society conceptualizes the problem 
or how a society is shaping some a problem in you know um, in general. And I think that's well, that's really good, and that is a really interesting period to be a linguist. Mm, I agree. I agree. Thank mm. you, um, Tim. Okay, I was going to say validation, but uh, Lucia stole my own. Ah. <laughs> um, but what I'm, I'm going to take a slightly different tack then, which is, so corpus linguistics was one of the original big data approaches, the data science approaches to, to, to analysing the world. And, and if you look at progress of corpus linguistics, it, it starts at a fairly low level of analysis, looking at word positions within sentences, within you know, millions of words or so on. And now most of the interesting work in corpus linguistics is... Uh, or to me is work at the sort of the, the pragmatic and discourse level of texts. So we're move, shifting up a level into an area of the meaningfulness of text and how, how we mean with language in a much more rich way. Mm -hmm. And I think corpus linguistics is leading data analytics in that direction. And we will see data analytics getting less crude and more sophisticated in drawing meanings. And, and so I think there's a sort of methodological learning that the corpus linguistics is leading the world in as well. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. And I look forward to, to seeing that uh, <laughs> happening yeah. in the future. Um, well, I wanna bring things to a close now and thank both Tim Grant and Lucia Busso for uh, coming on today. It's been a really, really interesting conversation um, and it was such a pleasure to have you both. So really, thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah. So that is that is it for this uh, episode of Corpus Cast. Thank you for joining us. Um, however you've accessed us, whether that's on YouTube or Spotify or Google Podcasts or Podcast Addict or Pod Chaser, uh, all the pods, um, please do let us know your thoughts about this and other episodes using the hashtag Corpus Cast and make sure to check out the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on Twitter at Aston Corpus. Uh, Corpus Cast is an Aston Originals podcast written and hosted by me, Robbie Love, and produced by Sam Cook. So thanks again, and see you soon on the next episode of Corpus Cast.